Welcome to OSLC Online, everyone. I'm Pastor Tim. Thanks for carving out a portion of your week to be together with us. If it's your first time here, I'd love to hear from you. You can complete a connection card at any time during our worship experience today. We're going to be together here and we're going to sing. We're going to pray. We have an opportunity to share communion as we continue in our psalm series as well. Kurt Anderson is going to be sharing on Psalm 139. So grab a Bible. You're going to need that a little later on in our service today. So as we begin, let's pray. Invite the Lord to be present among us here in these moments together. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for waking us up for another day together. And we ask now that your Holy Spirit would inspire our thoughts, that it would stir in us to, to stir up our love for you and would lead us uh, into, into your, your ways, uh, that we would echo what you have placed in our hearts through our singing, uh, in our prayers, and that you would teach us as we open your word. So we say simply, come Holy Spirit, wherever we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Our wonderful God finds us in the midst of our sinfulness and the muck and the mire, as the Bible says, of separation. And he comes down and scoops us up, pulls us close to himself, and lifts us up into the heavenly, heavenly realms as, as heirs, sons and daughters of the king and the kingdom. And so we respond. To a God who lifts us up with himself, gives us eternal life. Let's sing this in faith.
indeed God in Jesus lifts us up. His Holy Spirit comes and breathes new life into us. The Bible says that God in Jesus has come to bring us life and to give it abundantly. He lifts us up right where we are. We have an opportunity to come around the body and blood of Jesus in this meal that we call communion. So just bow your heads as we prepare our hearts to receive that. Uh, we say, God, uh, examine our hearts today. Remind us who we are. Remind us who you are, that, that you are not just the creator of the universe, but, but indeed you are the one who sends your son Jesus to lift us up, lifts us out of our sin, out of our shame, out of our past, into our future with you. And in fact, it, your, your word, you, you specifically say if, if we come to you and admit, if we, if we confess that sin, that you are faithful, that you are just, that you love us and you will forgive us every single time. So just in this moment of silence, wherever we are, we, we place our lives, our thoughts, our hearts into your hands, trusting you hear us. Let's do that right now. God wants a relationship with you, and that's why he sent Jesus, his son, to die for you. And he forgives you, he lifts you up, he gives his body and his blood on the cross for you. Why? So that you and I can stand here, we can sing songs, we can go to God, and we can rest in his forgiveness. Even as we are forgiven your sins and my sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. You can take your bread that's in front of you for communion, and we're going to share these words. Together we say, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And you can take your cup and say these words with me. After supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And this bread and this wine that we just set aside with the words of Jesus, you can share that with the people around you. You can take a piece of bread, say the body of Christ is for you. You can take the cup and say the blood of Christ is given for you. If you have kids, students, adults who are not receiving communion today, sharing this meal, you can call them over. Remind them that Jesus loves them all the time. There's nothing in all creation that can separate them from the love that God has for them in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as we sit in this promise together, we're going to sing this next song. Stranger 
the trials he will carry me one day in heaven our eyes will meet filled with wonder all the saints will sing the kids and women's minister here at Our Savior. I want to welcome you to our online children's message. You will never believe the day I'm having. Hang on, I'm getting a call. Hey, Jared. Hey, Dream. how's it going? Oh, you will never believe the day I'm having. First, I stubbed my toe on a chair, and then I locked my keys in the car, and I, then I slammed my finger in the door, and when I opened my yogurt for breakfast, it had gone bad. Oh, wow. Th that sounds really rough. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. And I'll be honest, sometimes when things in my life are difficult, my thoughts wonder if God really is with me and really does love me like the Bible says. I hear you. You know, last week, you talked about Paul's trip to Athens, where he helped people there to know Jesus. Do you remember what happened after that? Well, he was sent to Rome for his trial as a criminal. His crime was telling people about Jesus, and of that, he was guilty. But he was guilty of following what God told him to do. Right. On the way to Rome, Paul encountered a variety of problems. While sailing on the Mediterranean Sea, a great storm caused their boat to become shipwrecked on an island. One soldier wanted to kill Paul and the other prisoners so they wouldn't escape. But a centurion kept them from doing that. Then Paul was bitten by a snake. Everyone thought he was going to die, but he didn't. Because God had plans that he would continue to heal the sick and spread the message of Jesus all through Paul's troubles. See, God was with him. Paul knew that knowing God meant his problems were worth it. So he trusted God through everything. And you know what? God is with us through all of our struggles, too. Ah, so what you're saying is that knowing Jesus changes the way you see your problems. Because God is always with me, whether I feel it or not, I can trust that He's going to help me through all of my troubles? Totally. Thanks for the great reminder, Jared. I really needed that. Bye! See you later! So God's goal is not to make our lives easier. He wants to make them more meaningful. I guess sometimes this means going through tough challenges so we can learn things and start new relationships and grow stronger and discover the joy of trusting more fully in Him. Psalm 139 says that God knows us, sees us, made us wonderfully, and leads us. Knowing that certainly changes the way I see my problems today. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thanks for helping me trust you through all of my problems. In Jesus' name, amen. For more Bible fun, videos about today's lesson, and conversation starters for your family, head to the section called This Week's Bible Lesson in today's Kids News email. See you next week. Thanks, Dareem. 
Together, wherever we're at, let's share these words, confess, profess, say them out loud, who we believe God, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is, and what he's doing in our world and life today. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen? Amen. Good morning, we're the Barbers, and our scripture reading today is from Psalm 139, 13 through 18. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. I know that we are all kind of apart, either by time or by distance, but I just want to remind all of us that we can come together and worship because we are all unified in one faith and one baptism and in one spirit. My name's Kurt Anderson. Uh, I'm a member here at OSLC. I used to be on a pastoral team in a church in Eatonville, and currently I'm a missionary for Young Life, and I work in the community right here. Uh, I was invited uh, to share a little bit about my favorite psalm, and I picked Psalm 139 because uh, it's a psalm that is intimate and personal between David and the Lord. Uh, there's, There's no room to hide. There's no secrets to be kept. It's just a very relational psalm, if you will. When I was young, I just longed to be known. I think everybody wants to be known. In fact, I would wager to guess that everyone's favorite word is their own name. Have you ever been in a crowd, a big group of people, and you hear your name somewhere, and you just look around, who, what, what, uh, uh, Oh, and you're a little disappointed when they weren't talking to you? I think everybody is just longing to be known. I want to share a little bit about me growing up. I've shared in the past, but I grew up in a kind of rough and tumble family. We worked hard. We played hard. And uh, because of that, there's a lot of times when I was just kind of by myself, uh, just alone. My parents would be at work or, or taking care of responsibility. My siblings were, were much older than me, so I, I would just be alone. And, and I discovered with time, being alone all the time, uh, I would have some anxiety that would creep into my life. I would have some worries. In fact, it kind of became, I was afraid of some things when I was little. It seems like when I was alone, there was just this little voice that would whisper in my ear, hey, you're always going to be alone. You're never going to have friends because there's something wrong with you. You're never going to have the family you want because there's just something not right with you. I was afraid at school. I was afraid in sports. I was just kind of afraid all the time. And it can boil down to the idea that I was afraid of never being truly loved. I had listened to a lie, a silly little lie that the enemy whispered that I was worthless. And in Psalm 139, as I was growing in my faith and and doing the hard work of of dealing with my past, that I realized that indeed it was just a silly little lie, that God wants to know me intimately. So if you missed uh, last week, and uh, go ahead and look it up online, but uh, Pastor Tim talked about Psalm 46, and that was great. And he talked about God wanting to be a shelter or a safe place. 
And so I'm gonna pick up in my life how that worked. But before I do, would you join me in prayer as we are going to hold up the truth of God's word and use it to examine our own lives. Please join me. Jesus, you are so good all the time. Lord, you are perfect in your love, your compassion, your faithfulness. You only want the best for us. And yet sometimes, God, we just feel like we're not quite good enough for you. So Lord, I pray that you would uh, open our hearts this morning, that your spirit would relax our minds so we could hear the truth of, of how you see us, how intimate you want to be with us, and how you have a purpose and a plan for us to have an abundant life that is overflowing. So Lord, I give you this morning, I pray that my words would be your words, or better yet, Lord, I would only utter your words. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as we've come along in the series so far, we've discovered that Psalms are primarily uh, about life. They're about us uh, being instructed and growing and us uh, being transformed into the image of Christ. I know for me, sometimes thinking about that image of Christ, being transformed into the image of Christ has been a little confusing for me. Sometimes I think that there's a, uh, a way that I'm going to become a masterpiece, a beautiful masterpiece that should be hung on the wall. And I'm not so sure that that's the way it's supposed to be, but um, we'll get to that. I have some masterpieces that I love hanging in my office. My office is full of works of art, and I brought three of them with me today to share with you. Uh, I have this one. Uh, this one I've had the longest. I've had this for, for over two decades. And then I have another one right here. Uh, yeah, I, I love that masterpiece. That's, that's really special. And then, then I have this one. This one's really kind of interesting. But I love to be surrounded by masterpieces. And something that Tim, Pastor Tim said last week that really stood out to me is that, that God wants us to have a full life, but he doesn't necessarily want anything from us. And that he wants us to, to, uh, to be able to go to him as a refuge and a safe place. And man, who doesn't want a safe place? I really want a safe place. But where I get hung up is thinking about what if that safe place doesn't want me? What if that, that silly lie I listened to when I was a young boy was true and, and it wouldn't want me? Well, that's the beauty of Psalm 139. So if you have a Bible, get it out and, and let's just take a look at what's going on, at how God sees us and wants to be with us. Now, I'll be reading out uh, a version of the Bible that's probably gonna sound a little different than yours, and that's fine. Uh, go ahead and use yours. Use the words you're familiar with. We're going to get to the same destination. So let's look at the first part, and this is God's knowledge of us. This is how well God knows us. Starting in verse one, O Lord, you examine me and know. You know when I sit down and when I get up. Even from far away, you understand my motives. You carefully observe me when I travel and when I lie down to rest. You are aware of everything I do. Certainly my tongue does not frame a word without you, O Lord, being thoroughly aware of it. You squeeze me in from behind and in front. You place your hand on me. Your knowledge is beyond my comprehension. It is so far beyond me, I am unable to fathom it. Wait a minute. God knows me like that? He knows everything about me? He knows that I have a quirky sense of humor and I love a hug for my grandchildren. He knows that, that I don't take anything too seriously, but yet I still kind of like to have things to be formal at times. He knows that I love my family with wild abandon, that I fight for the underdog, that I think everyone's dignity needs to be protected. He, wait, God knows everything about me? Oh, that means he knows that that sometimes I don't fight for the underdog, that sometimes my words and actions are not protecting people's dignity. Sometimes I'm not the best lover of my, oh, God knows everything about me. Uh, 
It's that thought of God knowing the bad with the good that makes it hard for me to run to the shelter of Jesus, to run in to that happy place or into that safe place. It makes me concerned that, that I'm not good enough and, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm canceling myself from God. We're living in a little bit of a cancel culture, but I'm, I'm canceling myself from God. I'm saying no for God that he wouldn't want to be with me. I'm saying no for God, and I need to be saying yes to Jesus. Let's keep reading. Let's see what else is happening in this psalm. So we found out that God knows everything about us. Now it says, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee to escape your presence? If I were to ascend to heaven, you would be there. If I were to sprawl out and shield, there you would be. If I were to fly away on the wings of the dawn and settle down on the other side of the sea, even there your hand would guide me. Your right hand would grab hold of me. Wow, there's really no place that I can guide, where I can hide from God. And even though I thought I could maybe cancel myself and say no for God, that's not even a possibility because wherever I go, he is. You know, we live in a cancel culture. Now, we see it in the news and on social media. If somebody makes a mistake or does something that's unpopular, uh, it's the end. We're just going to get rid of them. We're not gonna participate anymore. But this is nothing new. Jesus lived in a cancel culture. He was trying to be canceled. Remember when he called Matthew the tax collector, Levi the tax collector, he called him to be his follower. He said, you're gonna follow me and tonight we're going to your house and we're having a party. And all of Matthew's friends came and, and they weren't the popular people with the religious majority at the time. They were sinners and broken. Uh, there were people that nobody wanted to be with, but Jesus was calling them. And there were some really religious people there who wanted to cancel the whole thing. They're like, Jesus, what are you doing eating with these sinners and these tax collectors, these gluttons, these people? Why, how, why would you wanna be with these people? And Jesus' response was simple. He said, learn what this means. I want your mercy, not your sacrifices. I didn't come for the righteous, they don't need me, I came for sinners. So even though we might feel insecure and unworthy to be with Jesus, we're exactly the people that he came from, or came for, sorry. We're exactly the people that he came for, the ones that he is calling, those who are not perfect. And I can agree with that in my mind and I can and, and, and take that on, but then I think about, wait a minute, I'm sure Jesus is for sinners, but what about a sinner like me that keeps making the same sin over and over, time and again, and it's like, whoa, surely Jesus isn't for that. But then I'm reminded of Peter's ex exchange with Jesus, and Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Because that was the standard. If you forgave somebody seven times, then you could wash your hands of it and be done. But Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times. Seven times, 70 times. And it's not that there's a certain number where we get to quit. The idea is that, that we have to forgive because we're on a journey of being transformed into the image of Christ. And none of us are gonna get it perfect. And if Jesus is asking us to, to live a lifestyle of mercy and forgiveness, I know that he himself is perfect mercy and forgiveness. So there's no way we can cancel ourselves from being with Jesus. Let's continue on. So we're never away from God and we can't separate ourselves from God. He knows everything about us. And the Psalm continues in verse 11. If I were to say, certainly the darkness will cover me and light will turn to night all around me, even the darkness is not too dark for you to see, and the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Certainly you made my mind and heart. You wove me together in my mother's womb. I will give you thanks because your deeds are awesome and amazing. You knew me thoroughly. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret and sewn together in the depths of the earth. 
Your eyes saw me when I was inside the womb. All the days ordained for me were recorded in your scroll before one of them came into existence. How difficult it is for me to fathom your thoughts about me, O God. How vast is their sum total. If I tried to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Even if I finished counting them, I would still have to contend with you. Oh, in my life, that's been so amazing that God's thoughts for us outnumber the grains of sand in all the earth. Think about that for a minute. I know my thoughts towards God are nowhere near that. But God's thoughts for us are immeasurable. And even if we could count them, David says, we would still have to contend with God. There's still no limit to what he wants for us. Our names are in the scroll and our days are numbered. God has a plan and a purpose for us. He doesn't want us to to run away because of our shame. He wants us to run too uh, because he's going to transform us. These verses remind me of uh, what it was like for Adam and Eve to live in a time of innocence. Remember that in the book of Genesis? In the, in the end of chapter two, it says, the man and the woman were naked and unashamed. They'd never experienced anything hurtful or any loss or any anger or any betrayal. Everything was perfect. They were with each other, completely transparent and with God, equally transparent. It was a perfect time of innocence. But David lived after that, so he was writing about the world like ours. You know how it happened. They're, they were tempted. They broke the one rule. God said, choose life, and they chose death. And instantly, their eyes were open. the Bible says. They saw that they were naked, and their first response was to hide, to hide from each other and to hide from God. It's the first recorded time of cancel. They were trying to cancel themselves. Oh, I am not good... But God was not willing to leave them in that broken state. The whole rest of the Bible is God's story on how he restores our relationship with him uh, through the old and the new. And now that Jesus has come and had victory over sin through the death, burial, and resurrection, we can boldly go into that safe place uh, with God. Now, God, God doesn't cancel He wants to give us abundant life and that life overflowing. He wants uh, us to have purpose and meaning. And we can find that abundant overflowing life when when we learn to live like Jesus lived. We can't say no for Jesus. We just can't do it. We can't say, no, we're not good enough because Jesus is gonna finish what he starts. And it's time for us to start thinking about what would it look like if we were to say yes? The Psalm continues with uh, some justice for David's enemies and it concludes with a call uh, of response. Lord, search me, know my ways. Find anywhere where I'm coming up short, where where I'm not living up to the way I could to have this amazing, abundant life. So how do we say yes to Jesus? How are we molded in his image? As you read the gospel, Jesus talks about light. Talks about us being the light of the world. He's the light of the world. The light came in to illuminate the darkness. Even in Luke, it talks about the light of our eye, the center of our being. If that light is good, if that is a Jesus light, that light will just emanate from us. And we will have the abundant life that Jesus talks about. But when Jesus talks about the light, he says it's silly to try to hide it because a light on a a city on a hilltop, you're going to see the light and don't hide your light under the basket because uh, light that doesn't do anything, invisible light, if you will, really doesn't have a lot of purpose. It's just something that that doesn't do anything. So Jesus uh, wants us to be his light in our lives. Now, I know for a lot of us, I know in my own life, uh, 
that's really kind of hard to, to figure out. What, what, what exactly is, does that mean I have to be a missionary and go to a foreign country? Do I, what do I do? Do I have to be a pastor? What, do I, on, well, you might do some of those things, but, but living like Jesus is much simpler. In fact, I have found that the really meaningful stuff is uh, not things that anybody else is not- will notice, but things that at that moment, at that time, in that place, uh, are hard decisions to make. When our insecurities are really strong and we're afraid to step into it, just remember that Jesus' provision for us is stronger. Remember the story of the, the man with demons that Jesus healed, you know, they went across the water in a boat and they got out of the boat and the man's there on, uh, on the shore. And uh, this guy was so possessed with demons that he was completely out of control. They tried to chain him and he'd break out of his chains. They tried to tie him up, they couldn't keep him. His best life was living in the graveyard, living in the cemetery. And Jesus comes and this, this guy, uh, there's an encounter with Jesus and the, the demons in him are like, oh, go away, Jesus, leave us alone. But Jesus doesn't leave him alone. He heals the man. He removes the demons. Everyone's amazed. When the people from the town came out, the Bible says that the man was sitting at Jesus' feet, his normal self, and all were astonished. But here's the really interesting part. They're getting ready to leave because Jesus wasn't real popular in that area. So they're getting ready to leave. And the man that Jesus just healed said, Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to live this new life. I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, no, no you're not gonna go with us, you're gonna stay here. What I want you to do is stay and tell everyone what God has done in your life. And I can only imagine what was going on in this guy's head. He's like, whoa, Jesus, wait a minute. Uh, I don't even know what God's done in my life. And I, and I feel, I sense that Jesus' response would have been, it's okay, I'm with you in this. It's going to be fine. I have a plan. But Jesus, I, I, don't, I don't have any experience. I've never done this before. It's okay. I'm with you. I have a plan for you. But Jesus, this is going to be really hard. And my past is going to be complicated with my future. And oh, It's okay. I know it's not going to be easy. I know that it's gonna be a challenge, but this is where you will find abundant life. Just go and tell what God has done in your life. Well, I brought some masterpieces. Uh, I I should probably tell you what they are. This first one, uh, it's just a picture of some young friends at my house a few years ago. Uh, Young Life's a ministry to kids and they come to our house and we, pl- we play games and have fun and we get to talk about Jesus. You know, I'm, those of you who heard me a few times know I'm a one trick pony. I talk about relationships, I talk about Jesus. Our motto is we talk about life and Jesus. So all these kids are here, uh, but this is a masterpiece because boy, when I was their age, I didn't think I'd have any friends. I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't think I'd ever bring anything good to this world. But over 20 years, I've had hundreds of kids in my home hearing about life, hearing about Jesus, being loved, hearing that that there is a God who knows everything about them, who they can never escape no matter how hard they try and who doesn't want to cancel them. That's why that's a masterpiece. And then I have this fish. My youngest daughter made this for me. I think she was in third grade maybe a little less, and I've just had this fish in my office for, I don't know, 20, 25, 26 years. Everywhere I go, I take that fish with me. Uh, I got married as a teenager, as a dad, as a teenager, and I was afraid, and I didn't, there's no way I can do this. There's nothing, this is gonna be an utter, this is gonna be my family just going over and over, and God was like, even though I didn't really know he was doing it at the time, I was like, it's okay, I have a plan for you. I will be with you. This is going to bring you abundant life, the life you've always dreamed for. And then this last one, this I don't even know. Uh, Supposedly, this is a friendship pipe from Albania. I don't know. Uh, A number of years ago, I was taking some high school students on a rafting trip on the Deschutes River. We're gonna spend 
five nights out there, 60 miles of river. It was a great trip. A couple days before the trip, I had the 12 kids that were going over to my house for a barbecue and a party. I live on a lake, we're in the boat, we're, we're tubing, we're having fun, just so you know we can go over all the details. And one of my young friends brought a girl that we'd never met before, her name was Blerta. She was a foreign exchange student from Albania. And uh, I don't know if she enjoyed my company or she just felt trapped, but she rode in the boat with me the whole time while we're pulling for hours and we got to know each other. And, and it was fascinating learning about her family and what it was like to be in America. And uh, the Lord said to me, Kurt, um, your trip's full, but Blerta needs to go. And I'm like, no, Lord, you're, no. We don't even have enough seatbelts. No, no, she needs to go. Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about her. Uh, she doesn't know. No, she needs to go. But for whatever reason, the, the spirit was strong and I stepped into that and we invited Blerta on the trip with us. And she spent a, a, or the five days with us on the river and, and I learned all about her family and how she was homesick and missed her parents and, and how they were all Muslim, but she wasn't sure about her faith. And she heard the gospel and she heard that there was a God that loved her and knows everything about her and, and wants to have relationship with her. And it was a wonderful time. And she gave me this gift uh, when we got home. So I've kept it all these years. Now I haven't had contact with Blerta for a couple of decades probably. I don't know what God's doing in her life or, or any of that, but that's okay because um, our lives will never be a completed masterpiece until we're in the presence of Jesus. So that means until then, we don't have a picture to hang on the wall, a completed masterpiece to hang on the wall. The beauty of life, the abundant life, is the journey that we're living towards that masterpiece. Now I know God is working in Blerta's life in some way, but the abundant life for me was those days of enrichment where I was able to share God's light, where I was able to make a new friend, where I was able to hear stories and learn something new and be present because it wasn't what I could do for God by taking these kids on a rafting trip. It's that God wanted me to fulfill what he had called me to do, his purpose he had for me and that's to love him and to love others. So I know I'm not alone in feeling insecure and uncomfortable about stepping into that safe haven of the Lord that was in Psalm 46. I know that all of us struggle with that in some way, and I can't tell you what God's calling you to do. I doubt if he's calling you to take an exchange student on a rafting trip, but he's calling you to something. Is it with hospitality, with friends? Is it in your family? Is it something else? I don't know. But when you hear that silly lie in your ear, you're not good enough. You're not wanted. This will never work. Hear the truth that we have a God that knows everything about us, the good and the bad. And despite that, we can never separate ourselves from him. And he has a plan and a purpose for each of us that believe in him. And even though we fall down and we make mistakes, we just have to go back to him and make it right through uh, repentance, through asking for forgiveness. And we get up and God dusts us off and he says, it's okay, I'm with you, I have a plan. So please be encouraged that no matter how hard in this crazy culture we're living in now, you just feel like quitting because it seems like everything's in turmoil. Don't, stop listening to all that and say yes to Jesus. Just step into his safety and security and love and provision. Join me as we pray. Father, you're so good all the time. Lord, I think of, of all the lives uh, that you've brought around me, all the relationships and friends, Lord, and uh, how I spent all those years thinking I would never have any. And Lord, I didn't seek it out, I sought you out, and you fulfilled my purpose. So Lord, I don't know what everyone else's purpose is, but you do. So I just ask now that as we're praying, you would just nudge us, bring to light what it is you have for us. Examine us, know our motives, 
Search our whole being. Let us see the things that we are holding uh, onto that are keeping us from that abundant life you so freely give. So Lord, uh, we love you, we praise you, and I just ask that you would help us all to live like Jesus to the best of our ability. Amen. We're the Nye Writers. I'm Brett. I'm Juanita. And we invite you to join us in prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for bringing us together in worship. We are physically apart, Lord, but we thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you unite us in your love. We thank you for the beauty of your creation around us. In that beauty, we see your love and we praise you. Lord, we lift up all those around us who are struggling now. We pray for those who are hungry, those who are homeless, who are unemployed and who are sick. We also lift up those who are just very tired as there are seemingly new things that change around us and confound us every day. Remind us, Lord, to rest in you. We humbly ask for your presence, Lord, for your strength, your healing, and for your help. We pray for peace and reconciliation in our land and around the world, and we ask that you would help us be peacemakers to share the love of Jesus with those around us who are hurting. Lord, we lift up children and families in our communities, and we pray that they would know your love. We remember the kids and families in Nicaragua, and we pray for the work of Compassion International to provide for their needs and to bring light to them. We lift up our leaders locally and around the world for godly wisdom, discernment, truth, and compassion to be evident in their servant leadership. And we pray for those who put themselves in harm's way to protect others. Please watch over them and help them in their work that your love would shine through them. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. Blessings to you. Thanks, everyone, for Sharon, Kurt, for Sharon, for Brett and Juanita for leading us in our prayer time today. Right now, we want to invite you, wherever you are, to respond to whatever God maybe has laid on your heart. We would love to walk alongside of you to connect and serve in our mission to make disciples who love God, love people, and live like Jesus. Uh, You can let us know you're here and and connect and let us know how we can connect and stay connected with you by completing a connection card. If you're on our watch page, you can click on the appropriate button right above this video. And then if you're on Facebook, the appropriate comment link or link in the comment section as you're watching here today. Uh, Or, you know, you might be led to give a gift, uh, a financial gift. You can give an offering by clicking the appropriate link and button as well. And we we just cherish your relationship. We love walking together with you, uh, whatever that looks like (laughs) here this summer. And uh, if there's a way we can pray with you, we'd love to pray with you or for you as well. All right. As you are taking these moments to respond, just want to give you the heads up of a couple ways that we as a church are moving forward during this time uh, of summer. And one way is that we're continuing to feed and help provide food for local families in our Franklin Pierce School District through our Backpack for Kids program. You can learn more and sign up. There's only a few slots left to help and serve. You can go to oslc.com slash B4K to learn more and get connected that way. Also, coming up in August, August 12th is our Back to School Fair. It's going to look different for our community this year, but right now we are in full-out supply drive mode, collecting those supplies and resources for that fair. You can learn more and, and find Find how all the different resources and supplies that we are gathering and how to get them here to our Savior by going to go.oslc.com slash back to school. You can spell all that out in one word. The link is there on your screen and learn more about that. And then finally, just want to introduce this, all right? Faith in Action, traditionally, uh, historically, over the last several years, it's been a once a month gathering or so of people uh, gathering together here on site and then dispersing in different teams to serve in our local community. Uh, Certainly during during this crisis and pandemic, that looks differently. And so, so we want to place that 
action, that faith in action heart into your hands once again and, and just encourage you to serve wherever you are. Uh, we've said faith in action at home. There are different ways you can serve at home. But here's another way that, that we want to test or experiment with here over the next couple of months. It's, we're calling it the Faith in Action at Home Life Group Challenge. And if you're not part of a life group, on that connection card, you can click, uh, select that box, and we can get you connected to a life group. Uh, but we're, we're, we want to invite life groups to be mobilized, to put their faith into action. And if this works, we'll expand it even more. And we're so excited to see what God's going to do by placing uh, financial resources that we would otherwise use for our Faith in Action days into the hands of people like you and me to serve our neighbors in our neighborhoods, in our communities in very specific ways. So you can go to this website, oslc.com slash lifegroupchallenge, spell it all out. Uh, there's different ideas and ways to get connected, ways to, to connect with Christy, to, to learn more about how the reimbursement process is going to work. And uh, we, we, we're just excited to hear from you what this is this will be like for, for all of us and see if this is a way forward that God is leading to put our faith into action even during this unique and unprecedented time. All right? So check those, those opportunities out as we respond and as we go to continue to make disciples and love God, love people, and live like Jesus this week. I invite you to cup your hands as God fills us with his words, his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen? Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Let's close out by singing this last song. Darkness tries to rule over my bones Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Place to hide.